Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live Q&A session. My name is Rachel Otto, the Membership Director for the American Academy of Optometry. We recently hosted an incredible Q&A session with Dr. Julie Fletner, Dr. Greg Waldorf, and Christy Person as our host. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. I will ask that you please mute your devices. And the rules for tonight are to relax, have fun, and ask those questions. So the format will be, please, I would like for you to type your questions in the chat. And as they come in, I'll read those questions and our wonderful panelists will answer them. And while we're waiting for our questions to come in, I do wanna to talk to you a little bit about the importance of taking this step that you all are taking by just signing in and getting information. This session is for everyone who is just considering the process of becoming a fellow. This is for you new graduates who are just starting your careers and would like to jumpstart it by becoming a fellow. This is for those of you who have been in practice for 20 plus years, maybe even, and who realize the importance of this step. And also this is for those of you who may never have opened up an Academy website to look at any information and may just be wanting to get started straight fresh from uh, nothing, basically, no information at all. And then it's also for those of you who may have started your applications and got a little stuck along the way and may need a little bit more encouragement as you go through the process. So whoever you are, this is for you and I'm glad that you are here. And we do have a few questions that have come in. Uh, the first one is from Ms. Candace Alford. She says, I completed a residency five years ago. Will those points still count towards fellowship? And for this question, I'll ask Dr. Fletner if you can please give us a little bit more insight about that. Hi, I'm Julie Fletner. I'm national chair for the admittance committee. And yes, uh, the residency points do not expire. So even if you completed a residency five or more years ago, it just has to be an ACOE accredited residency in order to be eligible for the fellowship points. So if it's a non-accredited residency, it would not be eligible. Okay, thank you for that. I hope that answer your question. Uh, Charlene also mentioned that she has to log off for a bit and wanted to know where this will be uploaded. And Charlene, this will be uploaded on Facebook. So you can you can check that on your um, leisure to find any points that you may have missed. Let's see, someone else asked, this Rabia asked, if someone is interested in doing both clinical and research fellowship, are they allowed to do so? And for this question, I'll fill that to Dr. Waldorf. Um, that's a good question. I mean, actually, that's that's a that's an interesting question. That's really Absolutely. splitting it. Um, do you have to choose one, Dr. Flatner? I mean, I th yeah. So you're you know, you're the FAAO is going to be the same distinction whether you do the clinical track or the scientific track. Typically, if someone's actively doing more research, they would do the scientific group. If they're actively more just seeing patients, it would be clinical. But you can also look on the website to see, you know, as far as what written work you want to submit. So the scientific candidates have to actually submit three publications, scientific publications, as part of the criteria. Um, the rest of the points can be various, you know, other ways to get the 20 points. But for the clinical, the requirement is at least one case report. So technically that person could do one case report and four publications. Um, so really there is a little bit of mix and match. Again, the main criteria is the clinical needs at least one case report, the scientific needs at least three publications, um, and a little bit, you know, one way or the other, are you doing more research or more uh, patient clinical care to guide you? But the fellowship distinction is the same no matter what track you go. Yeah, I think it, I'm looking on the website now, and I think if you you would probably want to go clinic because it looks like under scientific candidates it says that uh, case, you're, those I, I, case reports I don't think are allowed for to go toward points because it says no on there. So um, I think to answer your question, I would do clinic because uh, if you did it as a clinical candidate, because then whatever you're doing, 
Yeah, the scientific would just be Account publications, yeah, posters, yeah, so. a lecture, residency, yeah, leadership. So yeah, everything but the case report. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you both for that. We have another question. This is a really good starting question too. It says from Aya, it says, Could, can you please walk us through the process of becoming a fellow? And I'll send that to either one of you, really. That's probably a question you both can weigh in on. Uh, Dr. Flettner first, if you'd like to go. Sure. Um, I mean, the first is just um, submitting your fellowship application okay, cool. online. Um, once you do that, you'll be signed to a subcommittee chair. Um, you'll need to um, upload your resume. And. All right, it looks like I got muted maybe, or maybe we all did. Um, yeah, and then you come up with your plan for written works. How are you individually getting your 50 points? And that's different for everyone. Some people have five case reports. Some people have a case report, you know, two posters and a residency, um, but you kind of want to come up with your plan. Um, and then you'll start submitting your written work and, you know, depending whether you're, you know, you want to finish in one year, two years or three years, um, you just have to submit by the case report deadlines for the year that you want to sit for orals. So say I want to aim to sit in 2025 for my oral examination, I would need to submit the first case report by February 1st and the second case report by April 1st and everything else by May 15th. <clears throat> um, so um, once all your written work is accepted, and then you'll be scheduled for the oral examination, and then you'll complete the oral examination at the annual meeting. And as part um, Greg, of your, there... oh, I was just going to say, and as part of your application, um, you need to find a current fellow who will, um, you know, propose that or you know, um, basically vouch for you. If yes. you don't know a current fellow, um, you can also be provided with someone as well that can, um, I think what they call a sponsor you. So yeah. good point. Thanks, Greg. Wonderful. I hope that helped. Great information. All right. So someone wants to know a little bit more about the process of the oral examination and what we should expect when doing so. I can, I can take that one. So uh... <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, the oral examination is not meant to be, you know, um, pulling these bizarre questions out of the air. I mean, it's really to talk about your cases. And they're they're actually, you know, it, I, I for years, I would go and retrieve candidates from the room where you're assigned to wait until you're you're taken back to your uh, um, section, uh, the interview. And it's just like death in there. And I just want to tell everybody, people, relax. It's okay. Because really, if you write a strong case report um, and, and they address, you know, uh, you address any issues that they suggest, you know, um, from the applicate from the uh, case report application, it's just a discussion about that. And, you know, you need to know all of the um, literature and research, you know, and not, you know, the, the, typically in my experience, they don't ask like real oblique questions. Uh, it's really about major studies um, that, that you should know that apply to your case. Um, and, you know, we want to see that you're doing most of the work. So it can be something I saw this, I referred it, and then I did a little follow up at the end. We really want to see your clinical decision making skills. So um, if you submit a, a strong case and uh, you've addressed all the questions, it's really just a conversation about the cases and they'll they'll ask you questions, but it'll be about, you know, like, what is this, you know, literature, very common literature that we all know. Do you have anything to add to that, uh, Julie? I don't think so. I think you said it very well. Thanks. Thank you for that. Wonderful. And that was my experience as well. I think everything was very straightforward. So as long as you do the work, you'll be just fine. All right. Next question. Keep them coming, everyone. The question is, is there a template for case reports? I uploaded one and the edit said it was not normal format, but I had trouble finding the correct format. Could you please help with this, Dr. Fletner? You don't mind answering that question? Yeah, I wouldn't say there's a template per se, but the if you go to the Academy website, it specifically asks for what's required in the case reports. Um, so it starts with the cover page and it tells you exactly what needs to be on there. You know, your name, 
um, you know, case report one, the title, a short abstract, keywords. Um, then there needs to be an introduction. Um, then the case report itself, including the differential diagnoses. Um, and then a discussion section where you talk about, you know, the pathophysiology, the anatomy, the treatments, um, followed by a conclusion and then references. Um, so I think the best place to look is actually the Academy website. So you can start by kind of just reading through those components. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, there's yeah. several ca uh, sample web uh, case reports on there as well. And that kind of shows you what the flow is. Sorry, Greg, what were you going to say? No, no, I was just, I was actually, that's what I was going to say is on the, if you click on the link, the become a fellow link um, at the very bottom, scroll all the way down. And I think there's like six or there might be 12. Um, there's a lot of uh, examples and you just kind of build it based upon that. Mm -hmm. And just kind of following the format, just what you read in the peer reviewed articles, you know, as far as third person, past tense, you know, not using any patient identifiers. Um, so, you know, just reading journal articles and getting a feel for how those are written kind of gives you a good flow as well. And, you know, one of the things I would suggest is we all know that when we write papers, we just get so down in it. You just, you, you're missing, you know, you might miss something that's, you know, ridiculously obvious. So um, I know when I was uh, writing my cases, um, I mean, any, anybody who I could stop to read it, I had stopped to read it. And um, so it'd be good to have colleagues, you know, and then I'd have them, you know, ask me questions, you know, what is not, is there something that's not making sense? And that's one of the ways I prepared for um, the oral interview. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, if you know anybody who's a good, good writer in terms of that can just help you kind of thin it out and make it a really nice read. When I was a section chair, you know, every once in a while, well, several times actually, but you'd come across cases and it was just a pleasure to read them because they were well-written. There was, they weren't too wordy you know, they really just did a nice job. So if you have any, um, you know, connections to anybody that can help you with that, um, that's a, a good thing to do as well. Yeah. And there is also a mentorship program as well. So obviously it needs to be your patients and your work. Um, but if your person where maybe writing doesn't come naturally <laughs> to you or you want uh, or feel that you need some help, um, there's a mentorship program as well. So once you're established with your chair and start the process, and you feel like you're maybe struggling or need a little help, you can ask for a mentor um, and you'll be assigned with someone, you know, of similar background. If you're a BV person, they'll find a BV mentor, contact lens or primary care. Wonderful. Great point. Thank you so much for that answer. All right. We have another question and it says, hi, regarding the case report, the candidate can do a case report in one area of interest or he can go ahead with multiple case reports with different, I'm sorry, I'm reading the answer. Okay, <laughs> I see. Okay, someone replied here um, about the, the previous question. I'm gonna go right ahead with the next question. And it says, I am a professor in Africa, schooling in the US now. We are to publish in a top notch journal in Africa, which is a requirement. So I have one paper in an African journal I submitted it for points in the scientific route and it was rejected because it is not part of the AAO journal. I want a clarification on that. And I'll say, um, Dr. Waldorf, if you could answer that part first. Um, what that, that actually, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Julie, do, where, where does the, I know there's a process to that. Yeah, so there's a, um, on the website, it does list all of the journals that are automatically generally approved for points as long as you're first author and it's well written. Um, if there's a new journal and you feel strongly that you know it's peer reviewed, um, that it meets all the criteria, then you can ask. Um, you know, you can send it to your subcommittee chair, who would then forward it on to the national chair as well as Rachel. Um, and there is actually a scientific review committee who reviews not only the different publications, but also, you know, if there's a meeting with papers and posters and, and you feel it meets the process where, again, it's peer reviewed, it's archived, you know, the person is face to face presenting their poster, then you can ask for the scientific review committee to decide if that should be eligible for points or not. Um, but they have pretty strict criteria on what makes it eligible for points. Again, it has to do with the peer review process, you know, if it's an archive journal, that type of thing. 
Um, so, um, you know, you can start by looking at the publications online to see what's already approved. And then you can also ask for the scientific review committee to, to see if it would be added to that list. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. All right. And the next question is about picking a case for one of the case reports. Any advice on picking an actual case to submit? And Dr. Waterworth. Okay. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I would pick something that interests you because you're going to devote a lot of time, a lot of research. And so, um, you know, if it's, I mean, you know, something that you enjoy, um, or, or, I mean, I suppose you could pick something that you feel like you wanted to, you know, you've managed the case well, and, um, you know, maybe it's not, you know, you're, I mean, I picked a, a weird neurology case and my background is more peds, but I was really fascinated with it. So I looked at it as a, a way to kind of review. I, I, I became a fellow after 18 years in private practice. So I'm one of those that came kind of late to the game. Um, but it, it, it's really, you don't have to pick something exotic or weird. Okay. That's, that's not a requirement. And you, you know, you probably don't want to pick just like a case of bacterial conjunctivitis. I mean, that's probably a little too um, too low. You wanna do something that's just kind of engaging that required a certain amount of clinical decision-making. Um, and uh, I think that's the the best way to go about it. And something that you feel comfortable um, you know, uh, you know, defending or talking about because you, you really are gonna need to know it front to back when you do your oral interview. Wonderful. Very good, solid advice, thank you. All right, so the next question is, uh, so can a fellow, either clinical or research, be eligible for any diploma program? For example, could someone with a fellowship in research later opt for the comprehensive eye care diploma program if the distinction is the same? Yes, uh, that's an interesting question that's never come up before. But as far as I know, you know, the only requirement to move on to your diplomat is that you have the FAO distinction. So as far as I know, you should be able to do a diplomat, um, you know, in any direction that you'd like to go once you have the FAO distinction. And the different diplomat uh, programs or tracks, I mean, if you um, like at, at the meeting, you know, once you become a fellow, if you sign up. Um, to be to belong to one of those, um, they they keep you in the loop with emails, and then sometimes you know they'll have like the Tuesday before academy actually starts. Like I know in Peds BV, um, oftentimes they'll have like an eight hour day of continuing education. Um, so that's another nice thing. But yeah, you can you can I mean you can choose whatever. Very good. Thank you for that. And this next question is very similar to one that you answered earlier. You mentioned being assigned a sponsor if needed, and someone wants to know if they wanted to find their own sponsor, how would they go about doing that? And even a mentor in their field of interest, how would they go about starting that process? And Dr. Walter, if you're getting ready to answer, go right ahead. What is the best way to determine? Um... Yes. So they're wanting to basically find their own sponsor and they're wanting to know the best way to go about doing that as opposed to being assigned one. Are you talking? Just, uh, well, I, I guess the thing I don't understand is, is this when you're writing your case reports? It sounds like that's part of the question. Or is this the person that, that's, that's sort of vouching for you as, a, as to, you know, to join? Right, it sounds like that's that's the main question, but they also mentioned having someone to mentor them in their field of interest. So it could be more of a two-part question. So, so when when you um when you're writing your papers or when you're you know kind of in the decision making process, if you speak to your um, um, section chair, um, they will reach out to um, to us, and then we will you know reach out to the mentoring committee, and they'll match you with somebody um, who has you know who works in a similar field or that would just be um, available to you to help you with the paper, and. How can we sponsor? I'm still confused on the the sponsor, but 
Yeah, I think they're meaning when they're writing their case report. You mentioned earlier that they could be assigned someone to. Yeah, yeah. So them. I mean, so you could, you know, obviously you could use anybody you know, any colleague. Um, you know, I know I know I used um, uh, lots of people from when I was in my residency just to take a look over, um, you know, professors and stuff. But yeah, we'll help you with that if you don't if you don't know anybody that you you know feel comfortable with running the case by. Um, we can we will hook you up with somebody who can do that for you. And then Dr. Flettner, did you have anything else that you wanted to add for that question? Yeah, and for the initial sponsor, if that's what they're asking, it doesn't even have to be anyone in your area of interest. It can just be a fellow that you know, someone you went to school with, someone you met at the meeting, um, you know, one of your former educators. Um, so for the initial sponsor, it doesn't have to be someone who practices the same way that you do. Just a fellow, fellow that's excited for there to become another fellow. Wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you, for that. So the next one is oh, jam-packed. A couple of different questions. Okay, so the first part of this question is that this um, person finished their ocular disease residency last year and presented a poster at the Heart of America convention last year and published in a publication last month. Uh, they signed up as a candidate in December of 2022. So that's background. The first part of this question is, can a poster and publication over the same case be accepted? Yeah, I can take that one. So the your written work does need to be about different subjects. So you can't say have this, you know, really cool case of XYZ that you're going to do a case report, a poster and a publication on. Not to say that you can't do that on your own, but each basically, you know, patient or subject can only be used for one of your written works. So say you have a really cool keratoconus case, you know, you can decide if you want it to be a case report or turn it into a poster, but you can't do both for points for the same patient or even really the same diagnosis. You know, partly when you're getting your fellowship, they want to see your breadth of knowledge. They don't just want to say, oh, this candidate really knows this one subject. You know, we want to see the breadth of knowledge and kind of your comprehensive care. Um, so, so I guess the answer is no, you can only use it for one thing. <laughs> um, is there a time limit for the 50 points? So technically when you apply, it's been a long standing um, in the regs that you have three years to complete your fellowship. Um, this is all, uh, last year we tried to make it a little bit more clear on the website. Um, you know, if someone's pretty well into their written work and has, you know, an extenuating circumstance, they have a health issue or something where they can't quite complete in three years, um, then there may be a one-year extension granted. Um, but for people who kind of do the three years and haven't really gotten anywhere or, um, really aren't moving forward with fellowship, um, I'd have to double check, but it's either one year or three years, and then you can reapply. Um, it is all on the website, though, just because we did want to make that question more clear for people. So the general timeline is three years. Um, if you're well on your way and there's an extenuating circumstance, you can ask for a one-year extension. Um, but basically, otherwise, you're taking a little time off and reapplying. Wonderful. Thank you. It's the third part of that he had a, question. He had, a, he, had a, he had a third question. I can answer that. So okay. it's really it, whatever you want to do. I mean, it, it, there's not a better track. I mean, that's like going to give you a higher standing or anything different. It's just, it's whatever you feel most comfortable with. So, I mean, I would think as, in a VA, unless you're doing a lot of research, I mean, man, you should be seeing all sorts of clinical, interesting clinical stuff. So, but it's, it's really whatever you're most comfortable with. Wonderful. Thank you. And that question was about choosing between a clinical or research option if you are a VA employee. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. And then this question is about the oral exam. They want to know how long does it typically take to complete the oral examination? And is it similar for the clinical versus the research track? I make the schedule. They're all 30 minutes long. <laughs> so, yeah, they're all they're all thirty minutes, and um, you know it, it's it, they usually go for for most of the thirty minutes. Um, but they they we have a very tight schedule. Um, they always stay on track, so it it would never it would not go over thirty minutes. 
wear comfortable shoes. It's often a bit of a walk from the uh, place where you check into the examination room. Um, to answer the other part of that question too, I do think the line of questioning would be a bit different for clinical versus the research scientific track. Clinical is mostly going to be asking you about your case reports, posters, that type of thing. For the scientific, because it's more research-based, you know, they'll be asking you about, you know, your methods. And really, I don't do much research, so it's above my pay grade, but um, definitely more the methodology and the research aspects of it uh, will be in the scientific research track. So there, there would be just a different feel to the questioning. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. All right, so this next question is, um, just bear with me as I work through this question. So the question is, do you know if my intern research project that was done with the contact lens manufacturer will count towards points for my clinical fellowship? So I'll pause and let you answer that part, Mr. Or Dr. Uh, Wardor. Is, um, I guess, I mean, my intern research project these all have to be done when you graduated right julie yeah so for um so, for any case i guess what i'm just reading is that was that as a student yeah i mean mm -hmm. it, it, i'm also not clear there is a little you know caveat that if you do research and submit a paper or poster while you're a student um if your first author if the um person overseeing your work signs off on it, you can occasionally get points for that. But I'm not clear from this question if this research project actually became a paper or a poster or something that is. So it's pretty concrete what's eligible for points. So just because you did a research project, if it didn't become a paper or poster or one of the you know, established ways to get points, um, then it would not be eligible. Again, um, sometimes, a student can use a paper or poster from when they were a student if they're first author and if they're um, whoever was overseeing the research signs off on it. But that's pretty rare. Um, mm -hmm. Usually it's only for after someone has their OD degree. And for, for any of these things, um, you know, when remember you're as part of the, you know, entering this process is you're sort of making a plan uh, for how you're going to, you know, go through this process, like where are you going to get your points? So this would be a, a, a wonderful question, um, you know, for your um, um, uh, section chair, just because if if they don't know the answer directly, and, and I think this is kind of in a gray area, we, you know, it, it sounds like maybe a no, but, you know, if you're the first author, um, they would be able to to take it to the people who would, in, who would be able to tell us if that would be something that's acceptable or not. So they we can include that as part of your proposal. At least you can ask the question. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Let's see, Dr. Julie, I'll ask you this question: Can an advanced degree, a master's degree, count towards points? And if so, is there a time limit over ten years ago? Yeah. So the master's degree you can use toward points as long as you're not also using a residency. So you can't get points for a residency as well as a master's, um, but any advanced degree in vision science or master's in public health um, beyond the OD degree or equivalent for some of our international um, candidates can count toward points. And there is no time limit for the master's PhD or residency, accredited residency. Wonderful, thank you so much. These are excellent questions you all. All right, Dr. Greg uh, says, I presented a poster at Academy several years ago. Do these points expire? No. Yeah, there is a little caveat. So if it's more than 10 years old, it might not be accepted, but then you can again, communicate with your um, chair and they might have you write a little, you know, one page paper on what's new since then. You know, even if you think about CRVO, you know, vein occlusion, how we treated it 10 plus years ago versus now. So um, so it may still be accepted if it's more than 10 years old, but um, you might just have to write a little update. So again, I would say that one's to be determined a little bit. Wonderful. All right, very good. And this one is for student fellowship. Uh, this 
Okay, this person says they are about to become a first year student. Can I apply? And who grades these written components? And so I'll have you an answer that question first, Dr. Greg, if you don't mind. The first Is this for the student fellowship? For student fellowship. They're about to be a first year student and they wanna know how they can apply. Um, you ha well, you have to, so I guess what's confusing me is, are, are you writing a paper or, or are they talking about that prep thing? That... I think it's more of the prep. Yes. And they yeah, I mean, typically you wouldn't apply for kind of the part of the fellowship where you're moving toward fellowship until after completion of optometry school. Um, there's the student boot camp, which you can do. Um, it's pretty new within the last year or so that makes you eligible for some, I think it's 10 points where you kind of go through a mock case report and interview while you're in school. Um, that program is pretty new. Um, and I think for most schools, they're kind of doing it third and fourth year. So we're excited to have you as a student member for various other reasons that are great to be involved with the academy. But moving toward fellowship, the student boot camp, you might do more your third or fourth year. And then really, you know, start submitting case reports and everything else after completion of the OD degree. Now, for and, and just in case we're what not ever clear, I think we are. But um, if you were to do the student fellowship, um, you know, that's where you go to the academy meeting and you have like a list of things you need to do. Like you not, might need to. I know last year students were volunteering, you know, um, helping candidates check in. Um, you know, you have to go to certain lectures, you have to go to poster sessions and stuff like that. So um, just in case we're, we're mis are misunderstanding you, that's the other option that you would have, especially as a first year. I don't think the boot camp would probably be, um, you know, the, appropriate at this point. But um, if you wanted to become a fellow in Indianapolis, you, a student fellow, you could. Okay. And could you find that information online in terms of applying for that? Is there a link usually, for that? For for students, usually um you they there'll be like a, a liaison for the, the optometry school. Every optometry school has an academy liaison, and um they they should have the information. And Rachel just put it in the uh chat. Thank okay. Thanks, Rachel. It's here. Thanks, Rachel. Yes, perfect. I hope that helps. And then the next part of their question is very good. It says, How has fellowship helped your career? I think I'll weigh in on that first, actually. Wow. I'll say that um, for me, getting involved has been very helpful. When I became a fellow, I wanted to gain more leadership experience. And so I was able to participate in the Flom Leadership Academy, which is only open to fellows. So that's one way. And as a result, I'm here tonight representing the membership of, of committee. So that I would say has been very helpful in gaining more leadership skills, more confidence, and then being able to network with fellow optometrists who are game changers. So that's how it's been helpful for me. And I'll ask Dr. Julie to weigh in as well on that question. Yeah, I think I just wanted um, to have the FAO distinction you know, as someone showing that I kind of wanted to go above and beyond, you know, for patient care, staying current, trying to keep, you know, my education going even after I completed school. Um, you know, whenever I go to the academy meeting and I'm surrounded by other fellows, um, it is pretty invigorating. I mean, as much as I love optometry, you know, it is a job and day to day, you know, you get, you know, can get burned out with patients. And I think it's a great way to be around other people excited to learn. Um, you know, you get the journal access, OVS, and then the new Clinical Insights case report journal. Um, you know, there's access to other journals because of your fellowship that you can access through the Academy website. Um, but for me, really, it's just, I mean, I know it's a the line, but lifelong learning and being around other people um, who feel the same way, just, um, it's pretty exciting. And, you know, if you do want to subspecialize, there's the, the chapters and the SIGs that you can become part of, um, which is pretty great, you know, and sometimes it helps you get promoted at work, depending if you're, you know, in a VA or, you know, in education, you know, that can help you get promoted. Um, it makes the meeting less expensive. I was uh, laughing when, once when um, we were asking someone about fellowship and they they brought that up, but it's true. I mean, you get 
once you're a fellow, it's considerably less expensive to do the meeting. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a great perk as well. So, right. I think it, it definitely gives you a leg up. I mean, you know, just it, it just it looks good on a resume. But but I would say, OK, of course, Waldorf has to make it weird. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like an internal thing. You know, for me, it was an internal thing for the longest time. I was terrified of doing it. And, you know, finally, I made myself do it. And it was really nice. And I mean, I, you know, like I said, I approached it a lot later in life. And so it was really um, kind of nice to, to crack open some books and start doing some research again. Um, so I, for me, it was just I was really proud that I was able to, you know, later on, you know, kind of approach it and, and, and go through it because I was always so terrified. And, you know, that's and I really had no reason to be. And after all this torturing myself for, you know, three years or however long it was before I did it. Um, you know, it was just, it was such, it was actually a pleasant process and I really enjoyed it. So um, I, I would argue do it for the internal as well. Yeah. And your hey. com committee wants you to do well. They're not out there to, I mean, it's not making, I'm not saying it's going to be, Oh, it was a walk in the park. They want you to submit good written work and be able to talk about it and show your knowledge, but everyone wants you to do well. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. Very good. Wonderful advice. Okay. Wonderful questions are coming through. We have another one. This past person says that they recently asked for a one-year extension. Is there a date that they should be notified by on the determination for that? Now, usually that question would just be to your subcommittee chair. I mean, everyone is just, you know, normal humans with their own lives and jobs as well. Um, but yeah, if you haven't heard back within a couple of weeks, I would email again. It, it shouldn't take that long to get a determination. So I wonder if they maybe missed your email or something. Yeah, thank you. And then Dr. Greg, uh, this is a question about international uh, candidates. And it says, can an international medical degree count towards your points? And Julie's shaking her head no, so I'm going to say no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I'm going to I'm going to defer to her because I know she knows. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, it's only an optometry degree. So in the U.S., it would be the O.D. degree, and then whatever the equivalent optometry degree would be for the international candidates. But um, that's awesome. You have a medical degree, but um, that normally wouldn't count toward fellowship points. Thank you for clarifying that. And the next question is from Trista. She submitted her application for fellowship in December of 2023. And she wants to know how she finds out who her chairperson is for that. She submitted the case reports, but does not believe that she's received any information regarding this. I can answer that. Okay. It will, <laughs> when you log into your member account, um, you can go under... Uh, my personal snapshot and your subcommittee chair information should be there. However, if you don't see it, feel free to send me an email. Uh, it's Rachel O at AAOPTOM.org. So I'll, I'll write that in the group chat. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rachel. All right. And this is from Rabia. We, we actually answered this question earlier, Rabia, but I'll just. Um, talk about it briefly. It says that she gave talks at the Academy's annual meetings in 2019 and 2022 and wants to know if she'll be able to claim 20 points from these towards the scientific candidacy. And the same goes for uh, years for publications. Yeah, it, I mean, for the Academy lecture, as long as it was a one hour lecture, they would be eligible for 10 points each. And I just double checked because to make sure for scientific. And yes, you should be able to use the Academy lecture for scientific. I'm not clear on the second part of the question, what you're asking about the publications, it's, same years for publications. Oh, did she have... Three, three publications. publications. Yeah. I think there were three. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, as long as they are in the approved journals, as long as you're first author, um, then they should be eligible for points. And they, again, it should be about you know somewhat different topics as well. Well, thank you. All right, we have time for a few more questions here. Uh, this one says, once you become a fellow, do you have to continue being a member of the Academy? 
to keep your fellowship distinction? Very good question. Dr. Greg, would you like to weigh in on that one? Uh, yes, um, you do have to. I can't remember the what's the number of meetings every it's every 10 years. Um, you have to be you have to remain a member. And um, there's a point system um, that you have to like for every academy you attend. It's like a certain number. Do you know the answer to that? Yeah. No, I know there's maintenance of fellowship, but yeah, Rachel can answer. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Why am I no talking? Worries. <laughs> it's our maintenance of fellowship program. You have to obtain 15 points within a 10 year period, and it does automatically renew every 10 years. Uh, so you do have to come to at least one annual meeting, and that annual meeting is good for uh, three points just for registering. Very good. Thank you for that. Let's see here. Um, so it's this one's question as well. Let's see here. Okay. When I apply, do I need to list all of my case report topics on the application? If so, can I change the topics later? And Dr. Julie, if you don't mind answering that question. Yeah, I think it's nice if you can list what you think your case reports might be, but you can certainly change them later as well. People often do. You just, uh, the one thing I might stress the most is just having really great communication with your subcommittee chair. Um, that go, that really just helps on both sides. It makes life easier for you, then they know what's going on. So yeah, say, I'm, you know, I'm going to do, you know, a retinal artery occlusion case, and then you have another case you want to do, just check in with them. You know, I'm not going to submit that. I'm going to change it to this. So I think as long as your communication is good, you can absolutely change your um, plan for written work. Um, the other thing too, if you're say going from two case reports in a poster to one case report, two posters, uh, not only would you want to let your subcommittee chair know, but you would want to let Rachel know so that she can change um, in the Academy portal. Um, otherwise, when you upload your poster, it would go to a case report and makes it kind of weird. So um, communication is key. <laughs> yes, wonderful. Thank you. All right, so this question is about hmm, appealing. Okay, so I have colleagues interested in completing the fellowship, but recently secondary authors have not been accepted towards the point system. And that sometimes can make the same effort when sometimes they make the same effort as the primary author. Is there any way to appeal? Yeah, right now there's not. Um... Just in order to try to keep things, you know, as kind of black and white as possible, there is, it's just first authors only. It just gets too messy otherwise. And, you know, really, how do you know how much work someone did? So, um, you know, it is kind of what it is, but it's, it is kind of first authors only. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. We have another question here. This may be one of our last ones. Dr. Greg. Okay. Joey wants to know if I received my acceptance in December of 2022, when is the absolute last date that I could submit my last case report and which oral oral would I be sitting for? So this person was accepted as a candidate, but wants to know the absolute last date that they could submit their case report. So I think your last date, I'm, I'm glad I read this early because I had to do some math in my head. So. <laughs> So I think it would be May 15th of 2025. And you'd have to sit for the oral exam next year in, I think it's in Boston. If you're submitting only one case report, however, um, it's actually going to be due by February 1st. Oh, good good catch there. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, depends Sorry. how many case reports there are. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second part of that question, it says, if unable to fulfill within three-year period, after the one year waiting period, can I resubmit using the previous submissions? Yes, you can. That did come up when they first um, sort of put it on the website. So technically it would have to be accepted again. Presumably it would be, there's a slight chance if you had a new chair, they might ask for one or two revisions that they wanted to see, but you can resubmit your previously accepted um, written work. But if it's been that many years, I would definitely say you might want to certainly update it. It might make yes. it a little less painful. Um, so, yeah. Yes, wonderful. All right. So that is the end of our 
question period. Um, we do have, it says, can we get the recording link sent to our email? And Rachel, there is a, not a link, but it will be uploaded to our socials. Is that correct? Yes, it'll be uploaded to our Facebook and LinkedIn after. Wonderful. Oh, there's one more question that just came through. I do want to answer that one. Can I select a case report which is submitted in fellowship to present for oral or poster in the future academy? And yeah, so you, if it's the same case, you can do either a case report or a poster, um, but you wouldn't get points for the same patient write up, you know, even if it's in a different format. So yeah, you can choose if you wanted that particular patient case to be a, a poster or a case report. But again, we kind of want to see your comprehensive breadth of knowledge. Um, so we don't want to see the same patient or the same subject um, utilized in, you know, one or two or three different formats. One, yes, but not two or three. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for your engagement. This has been a very informative session. Thank you also, Dr. Julie and Dr. Greg, for your expertise and Rachel, of course. I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel now and she'll wrap everything up for us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for everyone joining us tonight and for submitting your questions. If you do have additional questions, uh, I will go ahead and put my email in the chat so you can send it directly to me um, and I can forward it to the best contacts. So uh, you can check us out on Facebook, LinkedIn, we're also on Instagram, and I think we're going to be on TikTok soon. So some fun stuff coming up. <laughs> uh, so also, we are going to be in Indianapolis between um, November 6th and 9th. We will be at booth 301. So please come and visit us. Uh, we have a lot of great things going on this year in Indianapolis. If you've never been, it's a really great location, uh, a lot of history. So uh, looking forward to seeing everyone there. And uh, thanks again. I hope you all have a great evening.